Well, howdy, everybody. My name is Katherine Kobar, and welcome to the Skill and Competency Development Programs, Where Do I Start? And I um, hope you're having a great time at the ATD conference. Um, this is to talk about my journey and some, some tips and tricks and best practices that I've experienced over the period of time. And what I wanted to, to talk about today was the competency and skills program. And immediately, like I said, everybody jumps in and says, okay, I need to start doing this. Uh, I've been given this task and I need to immediately start to look at, am I going to buy the competencies? Am I going to, you know, what system can track it? How can I do this? And as a learning and development professional, we immediately jump in and want to get things done. And I immediately said, whoa, hold on, because some of this is some of my, oops, I shouldn't have done it that way and do it a little bit differently. So to start off with, though, I want to let you know that I am a learning and development geek. I've been doing learning and de development my entire career. So um, this is from that perspective. So just wanted to give you a heads up is, is uh, I'm, I might do a little bit of the L&D speak. And um, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate. But just also is that skills and competencies programs themselves will become your best friends. They became my best friend because the data and analytics that it provided me were phenomenal and helped me be successful in implementing this in not one, but two companies. And, and so I, my perspective on this is to embrace the data and embrace the analytics and it does cause you to do things a little bit differently than you have in the past. Um, so again, it's my best friend. So my journey is six years ago, I was given the task of uh, deploying competencies at an oil and gas manufacturer. And they said, hey, we want you to come in. We want you to deploy it to 2,000 plus engineers. We have 700 competencies and 25 roles. and." oh, by the way, you're going to do this with no additional resources and no money. And so I kind of, you know, swallowed and went, okay, I can do this. Um, I, can, I can deploy the competencies. Um, been there, done that. We're going to do this with, I'm going to create exams to support the competencies, deploy the, co the, the exams. If they don't pass the exam, then they're going to be in a training class and, you know, no issues, accreditation and certification you know, been there, done that. And what I found is, wait a minute, again, learning from my own, you know, mistakes is, hold on, what is the real problem that they're trying to solve here? And, you know, do some investigation on that. And so this is where I wanted to, to throw out that question. I had a couple of survey questions for you because I wanted to, to, to get your take to see if you've had this same situation you know, to you. So at that point, if we can throw out that survey, I I think that would be, you know, great. This is perfect timing for it. So Ayanna, do you have that up? Because I'm, I'm just looking at directly the presentation screen and stuff like that. So I don't want to side rail. There you go. So very first one is, have you had stuff thrown over the wall to you to build and execute? Yeah, I, I, you know, of course, you know, I, I'm pretty sure everybody's had this and it's like, you know, you're learning and development, just go do it. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, the next one I think we had was a, another good question um, outside of that, because we're at 10 people said 100%. Have you been told we need um, however many day class, just build it? And I love this one because I've been told so many times, just build this five-day class. I want a five-day class to do this. Okay, why? And so the last one, one and I think after that is, okay, the one person that has, that has not had it happen to you, I want to talk to you after this session because you are a lucky one. And then the third poll is, have you been told, oh, that's the third Polling is closed. Hang on, let's go to the next one. Third poll. Have you been told that your budget and resources have been cut because we don't need as much training because we don't have as many as many people now? And this is one of the one biggest ones that, from a business standpoint, is 
with a reduction of people that have to, you know constantly occurs the other piece of that is a lot of times you need to have more training to help those individuals um, so these are all things that I've dealt with and what I found is that the data from a competency program um, provides you with the reasons maybe why not to do some of these things. Catherine, I'm so, so sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. I don't see the sli slides are showing, neither do people who are here. Oh, I apologize. I, I'm just sitting on the same slide. Um, we don't see the slides at all. Okay, let me go back to the slide deck then. There you go. How's that? Sorry, I was looking at your polling answers. No, we don't see at all anything. Did you start share screen share? Yes, ma'am, I did. Let me double check. We're saying speakers to you with your notes. Oh, you want to see my notes? That's perfect. That works perfect, doesn't it? Let me put that back then. There you go. So the next thing that we've got is, again, I'm going back to my journey, is that you've got, what was I afraid of when we started to work on this? So. What I was afraid of was failure, obviously. And then the other piece is, is that impact to how we do things in L&D. So within L&D, you know, you're, you're used to doing the, the content development, uh, running classes, exams, all those different pieces. And it was like, you know, are we going to be able to adapt to getting this data and knowing what we need to do with it? And then our team uh, from a, we had a, a team of, of amazing learning and development individuals and how do you embrace competencies to drive what you do and work with the business on that and then there was always the fear of rework for what we're what we had there so all our courses how we're going to have to rework these and readjust these to support the competencies and then the last thing is is less budget for de development and delivery um, speaks to itself and then everyone doing training and, and no control over this. So there's always a, a concern of you're turning over control over to the business and that your expertise is not going to be, you know, uh, looked at and everyone's just gonna be running around doing training. So what I did was I turned around and I, I started with the fundamentals. And what we did was is looked at it and said, okay, what problems are we truly trying to solve? And this goes back to is jumping in and immediately looking at, okay, I got 700 competencies, let's get this going. And looked at it and said, wait a minute, we need to look and see what problems are we trying to address? And some of the things that I found out from um, doing this and talking with all the different managers, as well as some of the, the executives, the vice presidents was, you know, are we getting attrition? to our engineers, yes, we are. Um, are we having compliance issues? Do we have government and regulatory? Of course you do. And then employee career development, we had a new graduate program and we had mid-career uh, engineers and they didn't quite know where they're supposed to be going and how to get there. Um, and we've all been in that area where we sit in that chair and we say, well, you're gonna do it the way I did it. You know, I learned this way, so you have to do it the same way. Well, we all know that that's not the most efficient nor effective way because things are constantly evolving and changing. So the next thing that we also had was a big crew change that was starting to happen in the oil and gas industry. Well, we've got quite a few individuals that are retiring and their expertise and their knowledge and that experience is going to be retiring with them. So how do we um, recognize that? what we're going to be losing and also plan for it so that we can ramp others that can help, you know, um, with getting that data and having that data internal to the company as we watch some of it retire and leave. So these are the things that when we start to look at it, this is what we were trying to do with the competencies. And from that, what we found out was, these are the things that are keeping the executives awake at night. And so what we did is in the analyst and in the analysis, as I can say it, um, what we turned around and did is immediately create the objectives. So when I went through the Addy, it was like, this is just like a training class. I would use this and I do the objectives now for the course. Well, this is the objectives for the overall program that we came up with. 
So in doing this, we said definitely with the attrition, we've got to be able to support what is your career development? Where are you going? Because now you know and you can see how to get there and also the levels. And I'm going to point out the tra- cons- uh, consistency and transparency because this was a big deal for us is being able to show people this is your path forward. This is how you can get there. And this is what we're expecting. So the consistency and the transparency, because from one group to another, we had inconsistencies as well as from one manager to another, we had inconsistency. And also the transparency helps for people to understand that. And then, of course, the big one for me is the highlight employee strengths and skill sets. We had a wealth of information within the company, but people didn't know about certain individuals having the expertise or the knowledge because they didn't work with them on the day-to-day basis. And so we couldn't see our entire workforce. This allowed us to see it now. So these are all the objectives that we start to communicate out to not only the management, but also the employees, because then they understood why were we looking at doing competencies and skills deployment? Because it can be a scary thing when all of a sudden you're asking an employee to sit down and fill out an assessment, do an assessment and, and tell us, you know, do you know this? Show me how you know this. And do that because then it's always like, are you going to use this data to, to lay me off? Are you going to, you know, cut my pay? Or, you know, w- what is this all about? Um, it's, it's not comfortable saying that you don't know something. And what is the company going to do with this data? And for us, it was is to encourage that development. So I, I put this out there is you have to start communicating the objectives of the program and all the components very early to help get that buy-in, but also get that comfort and that participation. So I bring you to a level set here on understanding the competency models because we all talk this and I've heard, you know, we, we talk about the skills and competencies and all the different people and people many times will go, well, you know, we do, competencies and this is how we do it, not understanding that there's different models for competencies. And I bring this to your attention because most of us know, know and love competency assurance. Um, you, if you drive, you have experienced competency assurance. We don't allow you to get on the road all by yourself until we're assured that you know what you're doing and that you have passed the associated exams and you've had time to practice those skills, especially from a safety and regulatory competency assurance is what most people will relate to when you say a competency program. However, competencies for learning and development are a little bit different. And these a lot of times are competencies that you want to have continued development in, and they're going to vary. So example would be we use them in uh, a lot of the engineering, the geoscience, project management, education and medical to say, okay, as a new engineer, we want you to understand how to do um, basic designs. But then as a level three or four engineer, we expect you to create the design and test the the design and do a different uh, level based upon your level of engineering. And you continue to grow that um, as you develop within the company. These are also ones that get set out there a lot of times for your behavioral competencies. You want to see an increase in someone's um, collaboration. Um, A lot of the competencies for learning and development are behavioral. They're also, they they call them a lot of times the soft skills. And also, um, we use them uh, for values. Um, We want to drive certain values within the company then you implement those behavioral competencies in this area. Also, this is also where leadership uh, comes into play as well, is that you will have a series of of competencies that are intended for everyone to go through that are your values within the company, but also then you expect them to be demonstrating those at different levels as they grow up into the leadership uh, positions within the company. So this is those foundational ones that um, everyone should be going through. 
So I bring this to everybody's attention is so that when you talk about competencies, you have to communicate this out because most people will immediately gravitate to competency assurance. Um, and we had both of them in the companies that I deployed competencies in. We were doing both. And that way people understood that certain ones that before you go out and do the job, you've got to be assured that you can do it and we've got to assess you and make sure. And then competencies for learning and development, we're going to have somebody working with you as you develop that competency, you know, and, and grow into it. So the other piece that we needed to identify with competencies was also how they fit into performance. Because so many times people would say, oh, if I've got all my competencies and you're going to promote me, oh, not so much. Um, because competencies in general help build and help grow your skills. And then you have to apply them and perform. So what we ended up saying to everyone is, look, competencies are going to be learning and development with the assurance. And the more competencies that you have, you should be able to perform better. But if you don't have the right attitude or work ethic or whatever it is, then your performance might suffer. And in that case, is it a competency or is it a performance component that we need to address? Because I think a lot of us have a tendency in HR to use, well, we've got performance you know, issues, so it's got to be that they just don't know what they're doing. When That might not be the case. They know what they're doing. They're just not being challenged or perhaps that they're they're not liking the job that they do or maybe it could be you know more on a management item so when we did this we deployed the competencies and we told them it helps drive their performance so as you develop them you perform better now i will tell you that we did have some from the data that came back off the competencies we were able to see that we had individuals that were very very competent but they weren't performing and that allowed us to then start investigating and saying, well, why are they not performing? Is it because they're bored in the job? Are they not being challenged anymore? Maybe it's a good time to move them to another position that their competencies, you know, are going to continue to develop or might be a different set of competencies that they can then strive to get to and be challenged and still be able to perform. So the data did help us identify some of those items as well. Now, one of the major things that I brought, and I know this is an eye chart, and I know from an L&D standpoint, this is a big no-no to put this much stuff on the slides. The, the reason I put this much stuff on the slides was mainly is so that you would have it for uh, afterwards so you could have it as part of the PDF. The key area here is this is your engagement framework. I call it the quad model. And we created it in order to drive engagement with the business. So what we wanted to do was, because we weren't going to get any more resources or staffing to do this, right? It was, okay, how do we engage the business, get their support, and have them drive it? Because as I said earlier, we've all had that experience where it's like thrown over the fence to you, and you're like, oh, catch it, and then... When you execute it and you do it, the business is going, no, this is not what we wanted. Well, it's because you didn't engage with them and, and have all those components identified early on. And so what we did is built the quad model. We created what we call the Business Discipline Advisory Council. In this case, for me, it was an Engineering Discipline Advisory Council. And that engineering group was made up of director and above. And the reason was, is those were the folks that were going to allocate the necessary resources to the other areas and make it a priority. This group also was the one that when we got the data back, could identify what are the business initiatives and strategies and what are the competencies that we need to focus on developing. And so from a learning and development standpoint, I knew Here's our objectives for the year, and this is what we need to be focusing on. In the Business Dis Discipline Advisory Council, they also were the ones that identified the competency subject matter experts. And as I said, they would say, okay, we're going to allocate Sally to be on your competency team, and she would help 
identify the competencies that were pertinent for her role as well as others, and be on that committee that then looked at and brought those 700 competencies down to 300 competencies. And we also looked at the competencies across multiple roles so that we could find those competencies that were common and then those that did need to be differentiated per the role. So we had the opportunity to do both, is to have what we call the core competencies and then role-specific competencies. And what we found is these subject matter experts, because they came from all the different areas, they initially came in going, oh, no, 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 we're special. We're always special. Well, what we found out was when they got into the room and they started to really look at the competencies, they found a lot of common ground. And they also felt comfortable with being able to say, yeah, I could move over to a different position easily because I already have the same competencies. And through your competency system, you typically can see this and be able to say, oh, well, they're very similar. You could move over to this other job as a lateral or even as a promotion and be able to do that job because your competencies are common. So the subject matter experts were designated by the advisory council. So they knew it was a priority and they also were responsible for helping report back to that business discipline. And then a lot of times the competency subject matter experts became our training subject matter experts. So once we saw that there were gaps, then we could then identify, okay, who might be an expert in the field because we've deployed the competencies that you can see. And of those individuals, can they help us write that course or that e-learning or that white paper or whatever the learning resource that needed to be created? Can they help with that? so that we are making sure that we've got the content that can support that competency. And then the group, the learning competency and development team, this team, which is you, is responsible for this whole framework and the orchestration and management of this framework because you've got the expertise of knowing, okay, what kind of development we're gonna do, how it should be done, what timeline it's going to take, what resources it's going to take, that is your expertise. And so each area brought their expertise to the circle to make it truly functional. So this is a core component that before you start running off and looking at competency, you know, uh, competencies to purchase, competency systems, everything, I, I strongly recommend that you get your framework set up so that you've got everyone on board with why you're doing this, the objectives of it, but also you have their buy-in and their participation. Because again, the business is driving this, learning and development is facilitating it. So we went on to what we did is called the skill competency program phases. And we put this together so that when we communicated out to both the the Discipline Advisory Council, the SMEs, and the rest of the organization about where we we're at, they could understand the process that we were going through as well as what stage we were in and what we could recognize people for doing. Because again, this was their peers that were actually creating these competencies. And again, learning and development was facilitating it and orchestrating it. So this is a, a recommended phases to go through and also communicate. This is extremely important to do as part of the change management. So you get the data. This is when I get way excited. So with Kahuna, we were able to see all the data on the, the engineers once we deployed the competencies. And they did their assessments and we deployed it globally. And when we did this, it allowed us to see what we call the over and under. So as you look at this, and this is, a, this, this is showing the over and under, the green is over, the red is under. And what this allows us to do is open up each one of these competencies and see the complete list and levels of competencies. So something that's also different with competency programs is the, the capability is to have multiple levels. So in the past, a lot of times competencies were identified 
and it was okay, everyone needs to be at a skilled level or an advanced level on something. The issue with that is, is that you've got individuals that are coming out of um, you know, colleges and different programs and they're walking in and, and they're not going to be able to achieve that. And it sets an unrealistic expectation is I expect you to be at an advanced level right when you're getting here. And how long is it gonna take you to get to that level? And that's where people get discouraged because it's like, well, it, you know, you see a lot of competency programs that says it's year based. Well, it's going to take three to five years to get there. Well, why is that? Well, part of it is, is the experience. The other piece of it is, is being able to have that experience um, during that time frame. Can I set up projects to help drive that? Um, so with the over and under, we were able to see the different levels of engineers and also identified the gaps where we should have more engineers at a certain level and be able to actually look at each individual as well. So from a company standpoint, this is your company health. You can see where everyone is, what levels you need, and then go back to the business. And the biggest piece here is to start talking, what are our priorities? Because if it's not a priority to the business, then we might need to put that on the back burner versus putting it at a forefront to get content developed, get delivery, and get gap closure if possible. An example also where this comes into play right now, extremely important with the whole uh, COVID and pandemic, is all our virtual capabilities that you know we've all been you know doing over the many years, but haven't had the you know the the competencies identified that say, you need to know how to do a virtual classroom. You need to know how to do virtual presentation. You need to know how to do virtual teamwork. You need to know. We just kind of put it out there. Well, when this came about, a lot of companies that have competency programs created those competencies immediately and then deployed them to everyone because you can align your learning resources to that competency at what level that you need them. And that way it points to the right content at the right time for that individual to be going through. So what we've seen is a lot of the companies that we do business with, they immediately deploy competencies to individuals to help with the virtual and how to be a remote worker. So when we got that data back, the biggest thing that came back to us was we were gonna to have to tra change our training process. And this is where my L&D folks that we had on our team were like, wait, we, we're so used to having all the content ready to go when we put something out that it was kind of scary to actually put a competency system out there, align whatever training content that we had to those competencies and know that if we get gaps, it's gonna be okay. Because if the gap is not a priority, we do not need to develop for it right at this time. So it does change your process for content development. What we did is we identified the gaps and then prioritized with the business. If project management was not a priority right at this time because we had enough people that knew of that and had that expertise, then we did not do anything more for project management. And maybe even we didn't deliver as many courses for project management because it wasn't. Um, a big priority at that time. What we would then also look at is the level of training um, and the level of that competency. If we identified something to be awareness or fundamental, then a lot of times we would look at different types of e-learning resources that we could use. You know, we all have agreements with um, some of the, the organizations, obviously, that are part of this event. I think we've got, you know, Skillsoft and Cornerstone and a lot that provide content and amazing training, we aligned a lot of our training um, that we had with them to our competencies that were at sometimes an awareness level or a beginning skilled level in order for people to, knew, to know what content would help them develop that competency. So that's what I'm saying is, is you've got a lot of stuff already from an L&D standpoint. You can align them to the competencies for what you currently have and then look to then 
what competencies you need to develop content for. Once we got that, we turned around and aligned it, as we said, and then we scheduled those competency, the, the classes that we did have at the skilled level to the different areas. And what was unique about that is that I could see that we had 45 people that needed a specific technical training course in an area and could schedule that out and then turn around and, and then send that communication to the manager and say, you know, manager, we've got these courses being delivered in your area and you have these individuals that are showing this to be a gap. It would be a good consideration to put them in one of these classes to help build that competency. And immediately the managers would embrace that because now they were being, uh, be, had the opportunity then to go back to the employee and say, hey, you know, Sally, here's a course coming up. Why don't we get you in it? And they could also then budget that and see where that needed to be so that from a resource standpoint, Sally could go to the class and someone else could fill in for her while she was attending that class. So it gave them a better true development process for their individuals. And for the individuals that we had a lot of e-learning that was available, we would do targeted communications to those. Hey, we, you know, we see that you need, um, you know, additional collaboration skills. Here's a collaboration online capability, you know, course that you can go through. And our employees appreciated it because now they knew something that was being directly targeted at them. And from an L&D standpoint, I knew the resources, I knew the money, I knew all the different pieces for the content that I needed to create and also how to deploy it appropriately because that's what our expertise is in. So we were able to see an increase in our consumption of training because it was targeted and it was the right level at the right time. Because I think all of us have experienced the five-day class that you really only need two days of. And then you end up with a, you know, a, a person that's turning around saying, don't bother to go to that class because it, it's you're not going to get enough out of it. You only need this much time. So again, making sure that we did the right training at the right time. The outcomes of this. So from my standpoint is, is what we did, we were able to do the right training at the right time because of the data that we had and the engagement with the business. The business gave us the priorities. We were able to communicate those priorities out and then also direct people to the training that helps support those priorities to close those gaps for them. We were able to build um, and deliver training in a more effective and efficient manner because now we knew what our target audience needed based upon the business. And of course, the budget and the resources became more realistic because we were also utilizing our SMEs and everyone else to help with some of that development that we needed that was more customized and internal. And then could also say that maybe we hire a contractor to work with someone to build that course. Um, and then of course, the business accountability was a big tangible outcome. Um, the business was driving it. So it wasn't any more learning and development put out a class that nobody needed. The business was driving them to say, this is something that we need. The last things is that we had also the intangible ones was um, the inclusion. All of a sudden, because we had this data and this information and we had engaged with the business and were supporting the business, we were asked to participate in when we bought a new asset, when we were ramping down an asset. It was how can we keep our people and move them so that we do not lose these quality individuals and this experience and we can move them to an other area to help them develop and help them stay with the company so that we could eliminate some of that workforce reduction issues where you hire and, and, and you know, reduce based upon the business. Influence, we were then looked at to say, what do we need to be doing and how do we need to close these gaps? And the impact was great is that we saw it through individuals that from a nutrition, the mid managers now knew what career that path that they had for a technical development and um, truly felt like we had a partnership with our SMEs and could ask them to help out in doing some of the development um, that maybe it was an on the job type of activity versus a, a true training class. And then the last thing was respect. We were able to turn around and 
see that these SMEs were coming to us asking us, hey, how can we make these classes better? What what other things do you know in learning and development that can can make it fun for learning instead of it being, you know, oh, you know, this is this is a, a boring class with all it is is just straight lecture. So I bring this to your point too, it's all about you. So the objective of, of this presentation was to tell you is the quad model is to drive engagement and accountability for the business and to also have L&D engage directly with the business. Don't wait for somebody to throw something over the fence to you. Go to the business, set this type of model up or something that will work along this line so that you've got that engagement and you can get their participation in the development of their employees that are going to help the company to drive, you know, better revenue, better results. Um, so you are the one that facilitates this and you are the L&D professional that can drive this. The other thing is, is that I've seen a lot of times is people get scared of competency data, especially L&D, because they feel like it's a replacement for them instead of embracing it. So if, L, if your competency program and skills program is part of L&D, then hats off to you. You've got the data right at your fingertips. If it's not, if it's part of another area of your company, go get that data because this allows you to truly see what needs to be those development components um, that you build to help people. So again, use that data, use it in every way that you can to help develop individuals. And then educate and communicate what you're doing and why you're doing it. A lot of times as an L&D professional, we sit back and we wait for somebody to, number one, tell us what to do, the business even to tell us what to do. And then we're not very good at communicating out why we're doing it, what the outcomes will be of it, all those change management. So people will embrace this because really it's all about that you're trying to help develop them. So if you can communicate this, um, your, your objectives of a competency program, your phases of it, and also the model that you're using so that they know that it's being driven by the business, then you'll be successful. So in closing, if anybody has any type of questions, you know, ask away um, and reach out to me. My information is included. And also don't forget to come and visit us at the virtual um, exhibit center. Kahuna's there. I will tell you that, you know, I work for Kahuna. Um, I was successful implementing uh, the Kahuna with two different companies. So I practice what I preached. Um, in this case, it's just the reverse. I, I was actually practicing before I'm preaching now. So um, love the product. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate. And thank you again. So let's open it up for it. I mean, I guess if anybody has any questions that you received online. Yes, there are some uh, questions in the chat for you. Go ahead and read them off because that way I'm not going to be flopping okay. through my screen. What's our first one? Okay, first one. How is everyone's employer closing the gap at your workplace? Repeat that again one more time. How is everyone's employer closing the gap at your workplace? So in the different workplaces that I've deployed it, closing the gap is done through a lot of OJT on the job training for pretty much at the higher level, at the advanced and mastery. And at the, the uh, beginning areas, I guess you could say at the awareness, the foundational and the skill level, a lot of times then learning and development components are used heavily there. So through being able to see what people are, are gapping on, then identifying potentially training content that can help them with that. But then also, um, after you've potentially attended the class, is that coaching or that additional practice? You know, what are you doing? How are you doing it? And applying it to a project or an activity is critical. And we also saw that because we were able to identify the competencies and have um, descriptions, you know, what we were seeing, then managers could help guide individuals in that coaching and saying, how are you doing on that competency? Let's look at this. Let's see how you're applying it and have a better conversation with that individual. 
So through learning and development components, training, resources, white papers, OJT for advanced and mastery type level. And that's where we also get into also mentoring. Uh, we had some of the mastery individuals that were masters at something become mentors for other individuals, which was also um, very enlightening because a lot of people didn't realize that they were deemed the master of something and that they should be mentoring someone within the company. Now we could actually say, we need you to do this and we see that you're out there.